Well, I have to apologize this morning um, because you're you're going to hear a lot of me over the next thirty minutes or so. Um, uh, but then you get to go home and you don't have to hear from me for another week. So uh, uh, Joy has to take care of the the children. Um, we sh- should have prayed for Mary. She's she couldn't make it this morning. I don't know if she's um, a health concern or not. But um, so she was going to do communion. So I get to do communion and the sermon and uh, whatever else comes in between. So uh, well. Um, We've been talking about this Relent um, series coming up. We're working with uh, Crossroads and um, the Vineyard Church. Uh, we're kind of doing a joint effort to uh, join together as as one community um, during this Lent season. And uh, it's a great opportunity, um, not just for us personally, but I think for, for us to uh, join together with other churches and, and really be the body of Christ, not just individual churches doing our own thing, but to really join together. Um, so I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's it's going to be a good thing. Um, so as, as you may know, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, which um, traditionally begins the, it's the first day of Lent. Um, how many of you could tell me what, what Lent is? If somebody asked you in one sentence, what's, what's Lent? What is this thing that people do? Anybody tell me what? Just summarize like in one sentence. Good. That's a good summer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a, those are good two good summaries. Um well, probably, yeah, probably the one thing most of us think of when we, we hear about Lent or think about Lent is giving up something for, for 40 days. Um, maybe, uh, especially for those of you that grew up uh, in a Catholic or um, Catholic church or not, um, they don't eat fish on Fridays, right? Um, uh, and some of us might just think, well, it's that time before Easter where we just sort of walk around and feel a little bit sad. You know, because if you feel sad, then, you know, it, that's you're doing the right thing, right? Um, but, you know, at the gathering here, we're not we're not a real big on a lot of rituals. We don't have a lot of, uh, we don't follow a lot of real hard and fast ritual practices. Um, so we don't, we didn't, we haven't always made a big, big thing about Lent, uh, traditionally. Um, we've got a few. We take communion every week. We do responsive readings at the beginning of our service. Uh, you know, singing. We we do some of these things, um, but but you know, generally speaking, especially in the United States of America, we don't really live in a very ritualized kind of world. Um, you know, we we don't generally. I mean, there's there's other countries and places where uh, religion really is a is a huge driving force of life in general. I mean, you, life is ordered around uh, religious services and prayer times and and all these things. But you know, in in the United States. At least anymore. It, um, sometimes it, Lent feels like a little kind of a strange, you know, outdated kind of thing. You know, a lot of people still do that. It's not really, you know, we're we're a little bit more with the with the times. You know, who cares about that? Um, well, to understand what what Lent really is about and and uh, uh, the the benefit of it, um, you know, as a history buff, you know, I always think it's important to learn the history of Lent a little bit. So. For those of you that don't really care a lot for history, I'm sorry. The next five minutes or so might be a little boring, but I'll uh, I'll uh, hit the alarm and wake you up after a few minutes. Um, well, um, over the years, the church developed uh, what they call a Christian calendar, uh, where throughout the year, each day is marked with a, a Christian saint. Right. So Valentine's Day, actually, on Thursday, uh, it was actually originally it was Saint Valentine. He was actually a real person. Um, he didn't fly around with arrows and shoot people or anything like that. Uh, well, I don't. He might have, but it would have killed people if he did. But um, didn't make people fall in love. Um, so I, I don't really know a lot about Saint Valentine, but I know he was a real person. And uh, I've actually got a friend that I uh, was actually my roommate in college. He's he's a priest now, a Catholic priest now, but 
he, uh, for a while, he would, on, on his voicemail on his phone, he would actually, instead of a regular greeting, he would, he would, each day he would record the saint for that day and just say a little something about them. So he would actually get people that were disappointed when he'd answer the phone. because like, oh, I, was, I wasn't really calling to talk to you. I just wanted to hear, you know, the saint of the day. So um, I always thought that would be fun to do, but I would never be organized enough to, you know, actually put it together every day. Um, so in addition to these sort of uh, saints are marked each day, which a saint is just, all it means is somebody that's holy. And so somebody does something particularly important, and uh, so the church has sort of marked them as a, as a especially holy person. Um, but different periods of the year also mark uh, this Christian calendar. So, you know, Advent during the four weeks leading up to Christmas um, is actually supposed to be uh, a time of preparation, uh, a time when actually we're supposed to um, to to think about what it leading up to Jesus coming, and it's actually supposed to be a time of preparation, a time of humility and sort of soul searching. Um, but you know, today we celebrate Christmas um, by buying presents. You know, the Advent season, we we rush around, buy presents, do a lot of shopping, get ready for Christmas parties. We eat way too much, listen to too much Christian music or Christmas music, um, and generally do pretty much anything that has nothing to do with Jesus. Uh, so this Advent season, which was meant to be a time of preparation, has sort of become, I mean, it's preparation for Christmas, which basically means it's a lot of shopping is what it's centered around. Um, Christmas was actually supposed to begin the 12 days of Christmas. You know, that song, the 12 days of Christmas, uh, was actually used to be celebrated Christmas was the first day, and there was this 12-day celebration afterwards, um, which led up to uh, Epiphany, which was the 12th day. And uh, that's where the song 12 Days of Christmas comes from. Uh, but today, you know, the day after Christmas, we take the Christmas tree down. We, like, we're so sick of Christmas, let's be done with it. Um, at least I was. Of course, at, at Lowe's, we had all our Christmas stuff out on October 1st, so I was, I was ready to be done with Christmas by the time it was, it was all all done. Uh, well, Lent is another one of those times of preparation, which, you know, as Carrie said, leading up to Christmas, or leading up to Easter. Um, Lent lasts 40 days, starts on Ash Wednesday, and it's based on the 40 days that Jesus spent being tempted by Satan in the desert before he began his public ministry. Um, but for any of you who maybe sat there and done the math, Tim's probably sitting over there going, wait, 40 days from Ash Wednesday is actually several days before Easter. Um, well, the the reason for that is that Sundays don't count on those 40 days. Um, so it actually adds up to 40 days, not including Sundays. Um, and uh, so it's a time for soul searching, confessing our sins as a way to sort of cleanse us before we enter Easter, which is supposed to be a especially joyful time because we celebrate that Jesus um, Jesus was that he rose from the dead. Uh, some of the things people do, we fast, um, maybe spend more time in prayer, give up something we really like, like chocolate, cheeseburgers, ice cream, peanut butter cups. I don't know why anybody would ever give up peanut butter cups, but um, maybe give up TV, give up exercise. I'm thinking about giving that up. Um, so it's all done in preparation, preparation for Easter. Um, and so it's based on this fasting. Now fasting, you know, technically is giving up food for a certain period of time. Uh, Jesus gave up food for 40 days, which is a very extreme fast. I've got a friend of mine that actually did, he ended up doing about a 37 or 38 day fast uh, where he just drank nothing but water um, for that whole period. And he actually, he was going for 40 days, but his body was starting to shut down. He had to give it up for the, the end of it. Um, he said he, his first day back, he ate, like bit into a piece of fruit and it was like the sweetest thing he'd ever ever tasted because he hadn't had anything for for so long um, so that's a pretty that's a pretty extreme fast um, I don't know if anybody else in here has done a 40 day fast anybody okay uh, 40 40 minutes is pretty good for me I think um, so uh, the early Christians you know the first couple centuries after Jesus, uh, no one really did this 40-day fasting, a, a full 40 days. Um, they actually would do maybe a day or two, 
um, maybe 40 hours to remember the 40 days that Jesus fasted. Um, but after a while, there started to become this um, push for actually 40 days of fasting. I don't, I don't think people actually did a full fast, but in terms of um, abstaining from certain foods and, and that sort of thing. The, the Council of Nicaea, which was in AD 325, where we get the Nicene Creed, which is the basis for the Apostles' Creed that we, we say sometimes, um, there was a, a bishop called St. Athanasius who, um, he, was, he lived in Egypt. He traveled around to Rome and some other parts of Europe, came back and reported to his church back there that, um, that people were celebrating these 40-day fasts during Lent. Um, and so he encouraged his congregation to say, you know, we don't want to become a laughing stock. You know, we don't want to be shamed because all these other people are being so spiritual. So we need to do that. Um, so I'm not sure I would have taken that as particularly good news if I was in his church. Because, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be like, you know, it's okay. They can do 40 days of fasting, and I'm fine with that. I don't need that. Um, but Jesus actually has something very important to say about fasting, um, which I think runs a little bit contrary to actually what Athanasius' attitude was. Um, it comes from Matthew 6. I think we've got slides for that there. Um, and Jesus said, when, And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled, disheveled so people would admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father, who knows what you do in private, and your Father in heaven who sees everything will reward you. And actually, when it says comb your hair, um, you know, I had to get into the Greek a little bit here. Uh, what Jesus actually says is pour oil over your head. It would actually be olive oil, um, which I don't know if any of you have tried that, but it's not, you know, it's not real, uh, not something we do anymore. Yeah, it is for some of us. Um, I know. I haven't combed my hair in years. Uh, it's sort of a strange practice, um, but we do have to keep in mind that they didn't have showers in Jesus' time. They didn't really use shampoo necessarily, or at least not like what we use. And oil was actually something you pour over your head, and it would actually make you shine. Um, some of us don't need oil to shine, but um, Jesus is telling us, he's actually giving instructions to make yourself look better, um, shine, you know, when you fast. It's not not about showing off how spiritual you are by uh, look, look, going around looking sad or, you know, oh, I'm fasting, man, it's so hard. But he, he's actually saying overcompensate by uh, making it look like you're actually eating extra. Um, this is actually a really important point because we need to understand that there is a temptation when it comes to fasting. Uh, and that temptation is that uh, it's very tempting to show off how spiritual we are when we do things like fasting or other other sorts of spiritual practices. We want other people to know us. We want someone else to see what a great sacrifice I'm making. Um, but fasting is not about other people. It has nothing to do with other people. It's between you and God. Um, that's why Jesus says, uh, No one will notice except your Father, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Uh, fasting, is, fasting is meant actually to help your relationship with God, with your Heavenly Father. Uh, in fact, you and your Father in Heaven can share this little secret. Oh, we're fasting. Nobody else knows. And there's great blessings that can come when we focus on God and do something only for Him, not for anybody else. So fasting really is about prayer. It's about our relationship with God, about being with Him. You give something up so you can be closer to God. Uh, this is actually very similar to something that Jesus said about another, another ritual that um, was observed in His time called the Sabbath. Uh, you remember, may remember that um, that Jesus was challenged about supposedly working on the Sabbath. And he says the words, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this actually comes from a passage, um, one of the places is from Mark, Mark chapter 2, um, where it says, uh, and, um, it says, One Sabbath day, uh, and you know, Sabbath day was the day when the Jews would not work or do any, any kind of work. It was a day of rest. Um, similar to our Sundays, but a little different. It says, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. 
And they would rub them in their hands. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Does that sound a little ridiculous to you? Picking off heads of grain and rubbing them in your hands, that's harvesting? Where's the big combines? You know, that's harvesting, right? right. Um, well, Jesus says to them, Haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Uh, I want you to notice in this, this little scene how the Pharisees are, are overly worried about legal rules. Uh, they're concerned about whether we're doing the right things, following the right rules for the Sabbath. Now, it's a good thing that they're concerned about doing what's right. Um, it's a good thing that they're concerned about purity. Uh, and that's, a, that's very important. God wants us to be pure, to be holy as he is holy, as the scripture says. But the problem with the Pharisees is that they're not concerned about Jesus' disciples as people. Um, or really anybody as people. They're worried about whether they're following the right rules. Um, but Jesus shows compassion for his disciples, even for people in general. When he says that the Sabbath came about because of man and not man because of the Sabbath, he's saying that the Sabbath really was a gift. And it really was. It was always meant to be a gift um, to help people, for the benefit of people, not to add another rule um, so that people can keep track of to, to see if they're being holy enough or not. Um, the Sabbath was actually a great gift. Uh, if you look back in Exodus when the Sabbath was, was the command was given, um, this was the, the people were coming, the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt where they had lived as slaves. And slaves don't get a day off, right? Slaves work 24-7 um, all year long. Um, they really didn't get to pick when to rest and when not to. They were told to. So when God led the people of Israel out of Egypt, um, they were former slaves who were given this great gift, a day of rest, where he says, you are not to work on this day. And that's a great gift when you think about it um, to people that never had a choice about it. Uh, so I want us to think about Lent in this way. It's not meant to be another rule that you have to follow in order to be a good Christian. Uh, I love how Jesus says that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, he's talking about himself as the Son of Man. He says he's in charge. Um, and what that means is that we don't have to follow what other people tell us we have to do during Lent. Um, actually, it means we don't actually have to follow Lent as a Christian. Uh, Lent was not something that Jesus established and said, you have to do this. Um, Lent was actually established by people, not God. Um, now, that being said, I, I think that Lent is actually a good thing. It's a, it was a good development. People did it because it helped, helped us grow closer to God. Um, but the question we have to ask during this time is, is Jesus Lord over every aspect of my life? Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath. And so the question I want us to ask is, is Jesus Lord over your life? Is he the Lord of your heart? Is he the Lord of every aspect of your life? Or is he just an option that you turn to when things get tough or maybe you start to feel guilty, feel I need something? Um, and so Lent in this way is really a time of preparation. It's a, it's a time of preparation to meet with Jesus. Um, but if you notice something in the Gospels, Almost everyone who meets with Jesus comes across him unexpectedly. Uh, usually they weren't waiting for him to come. Uh, Peter and Andrew are sitting there in their boats, mending their nets like every, any normal day, and Jesus comes walking along the shore and he says, Follow me. And they leave their nets and they follow him. They, they weren't expecting him that day necessarily. Uh, and so there's, a, there's another story I want us to look at a little bit more closely. Um, it's the story of blind Bartimaeus. I think there's a song about that maybe. Um, if he's saying about this as, uh, in, as children, there's a, there's a children's song, I think. We sing about blind Bartimaeus. Uh, but before we read the story, I, want us to, I just want to set the scene a little bit. Um, this is a story that happens in Jericho. Can anybody tell me something important in the Bible that happened in Jericho? Besides the blind Bartimaeus story. When the walls came tumbling down. The walls came tumbling down. <laughs> Uh, 
I don't remember that. Uh, it was Joshua. Was it Joshua fit the battle of, of Jericho? It's how, I don't really understand what fit means in that. But he fought, right? So it fit. I don't know. Um, I guess he was really in shape after walking around the city for several. Uh, uh, sorry, that was a Scott joke right there. On the, Um, well, Jericho, um, yeah, so, so Joshua was leading the people of Israel into the promised land. Um, and in the same way, it's interesting because Jesus is sort of taking the same route. And he's coming into the, the, the promised land again, um, but he's going to do things a little differently than Joshua did. Um, Jesus has been traveling for quite a ways up to this point, um, traveling from Galilee uh, down to Jerusalem. This is this Jericho is his last major stop along the way. It's a bit like if you're driving up Highway 27 up towards Lexington, and you cross over the Kentucky River, and then you're in the mighty metropolis of Nicholasville, right? The last roadblock until you hit uh, Brandon Crossing and you know Lexington. Um, that's a route I take a lot, so that's what I thought. Um, but I want you to imagine Blind Bartimaeus is this man, this this beggar, this he's blind, he can't see. Uh, he's sitting along the side of the road, doesn't know where his next meal is going to come. And if you put yourself in his shoes, just think, you have no real self-respect. People probably taunt you, make fun of you as they walk by, or just completely ignore you. Um, you're sitting by the side of the road, but you, you can't even see who's coming, um, or whether they're going to they're gonna have compassion on you or, or do something mean to you. You're completely vulnerable. It's dusty, it's hot, it's miserable. Uh, then all of a sudden you hear this noise coming from down the road. People are talking. People are starting to get excited. Uh, you start to get a little bit excited yourself because you've been secretly hoping for something. As you've been sitting by that side of the road, um, you hear people walking by uh, talking about this man way up there in Galilee. Uh, it, you've been hearing stories about people who have been healed. Um, Skin diseases are, are, are taken away. A uh, man's withered hand has been restored. Uh, fevers are leaving people. Demons are cast out. Sicknesses are healed. And you start to get a little bit excited because you're, you remember something you heard when you were a child. Uh, somewhere you heard in the scriptures being read, the spirit of, spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and sight to the blind. Is it possible that this man might be the one to restore your sight, to let you see again, maybe be a little bit normal. Uh, could this be that man? Um, so let's enter into that, that story right now from Mark 10. Uh, it says, Then they reached Jericho, Jesus and the disciples. It says, And as Jesus and his disciples left town, so they passed through Jericho, they're on their way, way out, a large crowd followed them. If you can just imagine as he's walking through town, uh, people start to hear a noise, a uh, of who this, this guy is walking through, and they've heard the stories. So everybody wants to follow him and, and see what he's going to do. Um, so as they're walking out, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. And when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Really, he ran to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said. Rabbi means teacher. I want to see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. I love this little scene. This is, this is great. I love his abandonment uh, when, he, when he leaps to his feet. He throws off his cloak. He's so excited that Jesus is calling them, he just leaves it behind. He doesn't need it anymore. He abandons everything else and runs to Jesus. These are the actions of a desperate man. Uh, this man has been desperate to meet Jesus, and he's not letting anything else get in the way. Um, he's had high hopes. He's longed for God to visit him and let him see again. And now beyond his wildest imagination, it has come true. Uh, he wasn't necessarily expecting Jesus to come along that day. 
Um, but Jesus came. I don't know about you, but I feel like it's a little bit harder to identify with blind Bartimaeus than, than I used to, I think, when I was younger. Uh, I don't feel as much like a desperate man. I feel like my life with Jesus has maybe gotten a little bit settled, a little bit easy, um, maybe a little bit too safe. If Jesus came to me and said, what do you want me to do for you? I'm not really sure that I would uh, know what, what I would answer that. Um, maybe a, a blank check to write off my student loans. That might be a good thing. Um, but what about you? How would you answer if Jesus said that to you? If Jesus walked up into this room and said, um, what do you want me to do for you today? Um, what is it that you want Jesus for? to do for you today uh, what's the longing in your heart you may not expect to see Jesus today but I hope that in your heart you're hoping to see him longing to know Jesus because he's longing for you the reason some of us give up something during Lent is not to punish us or make us feel sad um, for any of you that have ever uh, spent any time fasting and done any kind of fast a long one or a short one um, you know that it, it makes you more aware uh, when you give up food um, for for a little bit of a time, you become aware of how hungry you are. That's the first thing. It's like, oh man, you know, you go you go an hour and you know that you can't eat for for a while, and you go an hour, you're like, oh, I'm starving. Gosh, I just I need to eat. You're craving things, you know, even though you normally wouldn't. Um, so part of the thing that that fasting does is I think it makes us crave God. It should make us crave God more. You know, when we think about the craving of our stomach, we, we think about the craving in our soul for God. Um, and so it's meant to make us more aware of our need for Him. Um, so really, I, I think prayer, prayer is really the most important thing that we can do during Lent. Um, now, I'm not talking about just closing your eyes, bow your heads. Um, that's important, but um, I'm talking about the kind of prayer where uh, it makes us more aware, opens our eyes to see that God is with us. Um, that he's right here, right beside us, where we can see what he's doing in our lives and where we can look up and see the needs of other people in our lives, look up from our own lives, our own wants, our own needs, and say, uh, it's not just about what I want, what, what my need is, but can I really look around me and see what other people's needs are? Uh, am I aware? Uh, when, when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he was ready, and he cried out to Jesus in prayer. Um, that, that phrase, son of David, um, if you know anything about what that means, son of David means uh, actually the, the Jewish Messiah, right? They, they had hopes for the Savior to come who's going to deliver them from from the, the terrible Romans that were just taking over. Um, and so when he says son of David, he is proclaiming that Jesus has come to save him. And he knows this. And it, you know he's ready. When Jesus asks him that question, he knows exactly what he's going to answer. Um, so, in closing, um, I just want us to think for a moment about prayer. What is your prayer life like? And I'm not asking how often do you pray or how long or do you say the right things when you're praying. Um, but what is your attitude about prayer? Do you really believe that it makes a difference? Um, when I started praying, um, I used to pray for the whole world because I thought if I didn't pray for everybody in the world then, you know, it was, you know, something bad might happen, right? You know, because I was going to be the one to save Africa, you know, with my prayers. Um, and I, I might have exaggerated a little bit, but sometimes I wish I could get back to that first attitude I had when I started praying and just realizing that I needed to pray, that, it, that if I didn't pray that day, it was something bad might happen. I really needed it. Um, so what... What do you think about prayer? If Jesus walked down and, and sat beside you and said, what do you want me to do for you? Um, what would your prayer be for him? Um, that's a question for us to sit with for a while. Um, I was originally going to have us just kind of have this time of reflection and, and think about what do you want to do during Lent? Uh, do you want to give something up or um, increase your prayer life or what? But um, I'm actually going to ask the band to come on up. So... You know, this this was the signal we had, I think, for you to come up. Doesn't really work if I just say it out loud, does it? Um, but we're going to sing that song again that we sang earlier, Awake My Soul. Um, 
I want us to take some time just to think about, uh, and, you know, maybe when you get home you can think and talk with each other about something you might want to do different during Lent. Uh, but I want us to focus on being aware, on waking up our souls. Um, one of Jesus' final instructions he gave to his disciples was, was keep awake. You do not know the hour when the Son of Man is coming. Uh, like a watchman during the night, he says, keep awake, keep aware, watch out for who's coming. Uh, keep an eye out. Um, so, this morning I want us to focus on um, our need for our souls to be awakened. You know, we need to we need to to be awake, not just have uh, sleepy souls, but we need to be ready for Jesus to come. And and what would we do if Jesus walked in this room right now? So, so let's sing that song, "Awake My Soul," and let's let our ourselves be awakened. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing that.